using the novel uh, Lonesome Dove, 1985, by Larry McMurtry. It was a New York Times bestseller and awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1985. I'm going to uh, review the, uh, there's a passage, just a perfect example of Swain's um, <coughs> scene sequel. Augustus, the character, point of view character, is a goal, a conflict, and a disaster, a reaction, a dilemma, and it makes a decision that leads to the next scene sequel, which is, however, a Walter S. Campbell scene sequel, meeting, purpose, encounter, and Augustus wins. It's not a disaster. Then there's a in the sequel, the reaction, state of affairs, and state of mind. And that's what he's talking about, his state of mind, mostly, um, in the reaction. Now, that's uh, my summary in an earlier video. <coughs> They're very similar, I have six steps. Now one thing that is uh, different, oh, after I talk about scene sequel, we'll talk about the motivation reaction units in each. Walter S. Campbell was a big proponent of the sequel. Whatever you may imply or omit from the scene, you can rarely dispense with the sequel. This is from uh, Campbell's 1940 book. He says the sequel exists primarily for the sake of plausibility. Without good sequels, it is impossible to make the reader believe in your tall tale. In fact, a plot is made up of the sequence uh, of the sequels of scenes. Now. <laughs> More modern, modern writers, quite a few of them, say you can just omit scenes. In fact, that started with uh, Swain. He said there are times you can omit scenes, and that's true, of course. But again, later, Campbell writes... The sequels of scenes constitute the binding elements that tie one scene to another. Successful plotting, therefore, depends perhaps more upon the proper handling of sequels of scenes than upon any other one thing. Well, Walter S. Campbell was a strong proponent of sequels and... Uh, I, uh, I decided not to show you, but I have a whole bunch of books where they say you can omit sequels, that they're not that important, but uh, reasonable minds may differ. So let's look at chapter 56, the beginning of chapter 56 in Lonesome Dove. Now, the first part is transition. Uh... Gus, Augustus, uh, the captain, is uh, chasing the woman we talked about earlier, Lorena, or Lori, who has been kidnapped by a renegade bandit called Blue Duck. 
Uh, he'd made a mistake. He was going, I guess was going west, and he realized uh, Blue Duck had taken the woman north. So he's going north. He rode east going back, and then he's going to go north. Now, here is the goal. Swain's goal. He had meant, he, Gus, had meant to catch Blue Duck within a day, but he hadn't. This has been several days he's been riding, and uh, he's very worried. You know, she might be dead by now. By this time, Lori could be dead or ruined. Conflict. He was thinking about Lori when the Indians broke for him. Where they had hidden, he didn't know, for he was in the center of a level plain. He first heard a little cutting sound as bullets zipped into the grass ten yards from his horse. So there's conflict. There's 12 Indians that are trying to kill him. They're shooting at him. He puts his horse into a dead run, but within minutes, he realized he wasn't going to be able to outrun them. He had pushed his horse too hard and was soon steadily losing ground. That's a disaster. There's going to be 12 Indians with guns, and now it gets worse. Now, this is a uh, passage intending to make you worry, make the reader worry. Actually, I said that wrong. That, that comes in just a little bit. This is a reaction and moves into dilemma. You know, for a creek or bank or gully, something he could get out to and make his stand. He was on a flat prairie as far as the eye could see. He contemplated turning and tying, trying to charge through them. If he killed three or four, they might get discouraged, but if there was even one man among them with any sense, they just shoot the horse, and there he'd be. <clears throat> he glimpsed something um, white, white on a prairie, slightly to the east, and he headed for it. Turned out to be buffalo bones. As he raced through the bones, he saw a buffalo wallow, a place where many buffalo had laid down and rolled in the dirt. It was only a slight depression in, on the plain, not more than a foot deep. But he decided that was the best he was going to get. So, back up. Goal, catch blue duck. Conflict, India, a dozen Indians attacking. Disaster, he can't outrun them. Reaction uh, and dilemma, he's looking at his options. He can't find any place like a creek or a bank or a gully to make his stand. He contemplated going through them. and But then he made his decision. So that is a classic Dwight Swain scene sequel. So what is his decision? Well, now we go into a Walter S. Campbell scene sequel. Uh, <clears throat> the Indians were barely a minute behind him. Gus jumped down, pulled his rifle and cartridge rolls, cleared the horse, and dropped them in the buffalo wallow. Then he drew his knife 
wrap the bridle reins tightly around one hand and jab the knife into the horse's neck, slashing the jugular vein. Blood poured out. The horse leaped and plunged desperately, but Augustus held on, though sprayed with blood. When the horse fell, he managed to turn him so the horse lay across one end of the wallow, his blood pumping out into the dust. Once the horse tried to raise, but Augustus jerked him back and he didn't try it again. It was a desperate trick, but the only one he could think of that increased his chances. Most horses shied from the smell of blood, fresh blood. He needed the horse for breastworks for it. And he could have shot him, but he had saved a bullet and the blood smell might work for him. Uh, let's look at that. Again. Now, meeting purpose encounter. Well, he has uh, met his enemy, a dozen armed Indians trying to kill him. That's their purpose. Cus wants to live and rescue Lori from Blue Duck. Now we'll talk about the encounter, which I've already told you, Gus will win. Doesn't look promising right at the moment, but wait and see. They race down on him and one or two carried lances. But those were to puncture him with if they caught him alive. Now, the author, my poetry, wants you to worry about that. It's possible elsewhere in either this book or other books in the Lonesome Dove series, you know what happens if Indians catch you alive. They'll uh, torture you. This is circa 1870. Uh, and uh, they may shoot him in his knees so he can't run, shoot him in his elbows so he can't hold a gun, and then leisurely strip some skin off of him, scalp him. And when they're finally ready to kill him, they will cut off his privates and shove them down his throat with the uh, butt of a knife. So he suffocates. So Gus doesn't want to be caught alive. Or he wants to get rid of the Indians. Okay, when they were 50 or 60 yards away, the Indians' horses caught the first whiffs of fresh blood still, from, still pumping from the torn throat of the dying horse. The Indian horses slowed and began to rear and shy, and as they did, Augustus started shooting. He's got his rifle out. The Indians were dismayed. They flailed at the horses with their rifles, but the horses were spooked to stop dead, and Augustus immediately shot their riders. He could have asked for no better target then an Indian stopped 50 yards away on a horse that wouldn't move. The two men dropped and lay still. Augustus replaced the two cartridges. It's an old rifle. can only hold two cartridges. Uh, <coughs> and wiped the sweat out of his eyes. So now the Indians were trying to force their horses into a charge, but it wasn't working. Horses kept rearing and shying. Some tried to circle. When they turned, Augustus shot two more. And one Indian uh, did a gallant thing. Tried to get his horse to charge blind. Had a rifle in one hand, a lance in the other, though when he tried to lever the rifle with one hand, he dropped it. 
<coughs> the Indian, <coughs> excuse me, the Indian kept up the charge with only a lance. Augustus shot him when he was no more than 30 feet away, 10 yards. He had hoped to get the horse, but the Indian fell dead, the horse shied away, and Augustus didn't feel he could afford to chase him. Augustus uh, replaced his cartridges and killed a sixth as the Indians were retreating. Okay, so now we're moving into the, that was the scene, and he's won. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> now we're moving into the sequel, State of Affairs, State of Mind. There might be more Indians available nearby, but probably they had charged with all they had, in which case he had killed half of them. He took stock of the situation and decided, this is his internal mind, the worst part of it was he had no one to talk to. He had been within a minute of death, which could not be said to be boring exactly, but even desperate battle was lacking in something if there was no one to discuss it with. Okay, he's going into his own mind and memory again. What had made battle interesting over the years <clears throat> was not his opponents, but his colleagues. It was fascinating to him to see how the men he had fought with often reacted to the stimulus of attack. Now, this we're, we're halfway through the book. Kindle is 52%, so we're about halfway through the book. So the reader knows these <clears throat> three people that Gus is going to talk about, P.I., Call, and Dietz. So it's not really relevant, but he, he reviews what they do. And uh, the six remaining Indians had retreated well beyond rifle range. They were 300 yards away, so they couldn't shoot him, and he couldn't shoot them. Therefore, <clears throat> Augustus didn't consider that he was in a particularly serious situation. More than likely, the Indians would decide they had missed their big chance and go away. They might try to get him at night, but he didn't plan to be there. Come dark, he would head for the river. So he's made a plan for the next scene and sequel. Now let's look at the MRUs. Well, <clears throat> he had gambled and headed west. Well, in fact, he realizes his enemy, Blue Duck, had went straight north, so he has to ride back east and then go north. So the external evidence, he's no longer finding their tracks. Two horses, Blue Ducks, and the one that Lori's riding on. He's thinking Lori could be dead or ruined. Okay, motivation, the Indians broke for him. Reaction, he puts his horse in a dead run <laughs> away from the Indians, heading south. They were north where he was going. <clears throat> motivation, he glimpsed something white on the prairie. It's a buffalo wallow, and there is... A depression. So now he's made his decision. He's made another decision. Drew, drew his knife, wrapped the bridle reins tightly around one hand, jabbed the knife into the horse's neck. It was a desperate trick.
ovation. The horses, Indians' horses, began to rear and shy, and Gustus started shooting. I could ask for no better target. So, he has killed half the Indians. He took stock of the situation. He's got no one to talk with. He does what in true crime is called a suspect study, except he does it on a colleague study, P.I., Call, and Dietz. Now, the purpose of that is so that the reader understands Gus's state of mind which is why this is a Walter S. Campbell type scene sequel and not a Dwight Swain. State of affairs, state of mind. That's what Campbell taught. Concluding, they might try to get him at night, but he didn't plan to be there. Come dark, he would head for the river. The Canadian River is no more than two miles to the, 10 miles to the north. He can walk there during the night. Well, there's more, just, as I said, it goes scene, sequel, scene, sequel. Uh, and uh, I'll try to have another uh, video continuing this uh, tomorrow or soon.